Thank you for that. That was beautiful. So I'm here with um, Yost and Matt, and they've just dug up some yakon. So. Yeah, Peruvian ground apple. Yeah, so you can eat these raw. And um, if you're really interested in your gut, gut flora, these are apparently the best thing in the world to eat because you don't cook them, so they're totally covered with their microflora and uh, really good. In Melbourne, you can, well, pretty much we can grow them everywhere in Australia, but you can see that the frost has started to get these. So you can see how they're starting to go a bit dark and, and, um, and plus I've planted these really late. Another thing I do every year is plant carrots at Valentine's Day. And then that means that we can have carrots all year round. So I mean carrots all through the winter. They're still a bit small, yeah. But this year, because it's been so cold and we've had heaps of rain, you know, they, they ha haven't gone as quickly and as far as what they normally do, but... Dutch man growing Dutch carrots. Mate, Dutch orange. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, the kids, the kids come out here and for their school lunches and stuff and then grab some carrots, which is really cool because they're also raw and that's another great thing. But anyway, that's not why we're here. <laughs> So this is, this is a traditional veggie patch that I don't know how long I've been growing stuff in here for maybe eight years, maybe more. We've got a um, orchard, which is all apples, pears, um, nectarines, peaches, apricots. And next to that, we've got an aggie system that comes off our worm farm. So we've got a worm farm in the ground. So all of our sewage goes into a worm farm and that gets pumped onto the orchard. But one thing I wanted to explain was that this veggie patch, even though I put tons of compost and all the stuff from brothel and, and all the compost from uh, silo went into this veggie patch. I mean, you can see it. Sometimes you see mussel shells or you'll see like there's a lot in this soil. It's incredible soil and incredible color. But growing veggies like this over and over again, it just ends up taking a lot of nutrients out of the soil. And what happens is a lot of nutrients just disappear because the rain washes it away. So I got, got um, quite interested in a guy called Colin Austin. And I don't know if anyone's heard of wicking beds, but wicking beds is this incredible idea where developed by a guy called Colin Austin, a living legend, Australian legend. He lives up in Queensland. And when uh, the famine was in Ethiopia, World Vision invited Colin to come out and. Uh, give some advice on how to best get food and, and get nutrients and, and deal with water and try and work out how to best solve that problem. He went over and actually invented the wicking bed. And this idea went viral. If you go on YouTube, you'll see a million ways to make a wicking bed. But Colin Austin devised it because um, we can walk over. I've just made some. For you, Yosti. Turned the cubby house into, the kids weren't using the cubby house anymore, so this is our first ISO project, we just turned it into... So this is the cubby house, sorry, Yossi's back is to us, so you might not hear, but this is a cubby house. Yeah, so with the girls, we covered it with plastic, and you can see the dogs eat all the strawberries. <laughs> but what a wicking bed does, it, it, it basically... Um, it means you don't waste water. So if you look at this, I've basically turned a 44 gallon drum. I don't know if people know, but last year, 2019, we, sur we surpassed 100 million barrels. This is a barrel of oil. This is, this is how we refer to it as oil. But we use more than 100 million barrels of oil a day for the first time ever last year. Wow. And apparently we've just gone, that we've reduced that down to 50, uh, million barrels since the ISO crisis. So it shows you how much petroleum reduction has gone down. So I thought I'll start using barrels as wicking beds. But this is great because um, they're cheap. You can buy um, these for 20 bucks, 10 bucks. They're almost everywhere, they're ubiquitous. And it's very easy to find these 44 gallon drums that are, um, you know, that can be used as food grade. So they, they're used for transporting olive oil and, and uh, canola oil and all sorts of different things. So they're not difficult to come by. I love using black ones because black plastic barrels are always made out of recycled plastic. So these barrels made from 100% recycled polypropylene. And um, yeah, I just bought them from a guy who washes them out. And you, say, you just say, I need food grade barrels. They cost you 20 bucks. 
And so for 20 bucks, you've made a, you can make a, a, an amazing wicking bed. To show you how it works, you've got to get this fitting, which screws in. Let's and look at and um, there's two, two holes in the 44 gallon drum. One will allow you to have this conventional fitting. And what it does is you can, you know, it can hold up to 100 litres of water. So it means that you don't waste any water. The, the, the water wicks up from below and it's much better way for plants to access water. But the most important thing is that you don't waste any nutrients. All the nutrients stay in the barrel. And, and Colin, who invented this um, form of uh, growing, actually refers to them as G-Biota beds. If you, if you go on, uh, on the internet and, and Google G-Biota, he calls them gut biota beds because food grown this way has the highest microflora level because the bacteria in the soil and the microflora in the soil don't like drying out, just like we don't, we need water, we need air. So these beds are filled with really, uh, with, you know, billions and billions of microflora. So if you come in like these beds were only made six weeks ago and planted them out with the kids, you can see how everything's growing. And I've only watered them twice. Wow. So the first time I watered them from above and then I never watered from above again after that. They're just some turnips that, uh, daikon, that is? daikon, sorry, yeah. Look at them. So that's in six weeks, and they're, there's even bigger ones in here. Have a look at the radishes, though. that's a good one to show you because they yeah. And I'm quite obsessed with things that can be eaten raw, so there's lots of uh, peas, snow peas, lettuce. Have a look at these beautiful radishes. Look at that. Yeah. What I notice about them, Yosti, is that um, the height of them and then their size, really good if you like us and we live in the town, like in city, um, you know, growing at home. Yeah. Really cool. I, I love notice. that. Like you can actually have these also, <clears throat> because they're so inexpensive, you can actually sit them on top of barrels as well. And, you know, if you're in a wheelchair or you're struggling, th this is the perfect part for wheelchair access as well. And it just means that if you are in a wheelchair, it's much easier for you to, to grow food because you don't need to water it every day. If you're busy and lots of people's veggie patches just go to shit when they go on holidays or when they're busy and they don't water for two or three days, this, like in summer, you only need to water once a fortnight and in winter, once every four to six weeks. And what about if you didn't have um, a greenhouse, if you just had them out in the open? It makes no difference really, but the same, same formula applies like plants it's for, for most things that are grown intensively like silver beet and food crops they tend to all be really hungry and so they love this situation because they don't lose any nutrients and they love having constant access to water so all this kind of stuff really you know like with potatoes you'd probably um i mean the the, the beauty about these they always end up wicking because the pipe is not at the very bottom what does the word wicking mean exactly so it's when water gets wicked up. So if you imagine, uh, if you've got a bucket of water, this is Jess. Jess loves eating the strawberries. <laughs> Jess. Um, if, you, if you had a bucket of water and you put your t-shirt in it and you hung the t-shirt over the edge, <clears throat> you come back the next day, that bucket will be empty because yeah. the water gets wicked up. So that's why I can show you here how this works. Oh, like a candle wick. Yeah, that's okay. why they call it wicking. Yeah. So, if you see here, what I've used, maybe I haven't used it in this one, but what I normally use <laughs> is like uh, an old towel or um, hessian or something like that. Oh, so it's not um, stones or anything like that at the bottom? No, this okay. is, this is Colin. <clears throat> Colin Austin hates it when people use stones because stones don't wick. So that was an American <laughs> guy who copied the idea, started using stones. Oh, you can see I have used hessian. See the hessian there? And the hessian just stops the water from, uh, stops the soil from going down. So all I've done is that my off cut of the 45 gallon drum, I've slimmed that down a little bit and reversed it. And so you get soil going all the way down to the bottom on the edges. But if I was going to use this for potatoes, I probably would not use that because potatoes, you know, you could yeah. go down there. But we're going to make one, aren't we? Like to... I'll show you how it's yeah. made, yeah. But so you cool. mean, we're here because... Um, this is this. The three of us are about to do another 
pretty exciting project. And um, we're going to walk around and see if we can uh, see what's going on. We'll exclusive around. look. The first, the first yeah. time anyone see it. So it's called, um, well, we haven't decided what it's called yet. We're probably we keep changing our name, don't we? Yeah, yeah I'll oh, come from this side. Future food system is yeah. kind of... Um, so you're food. about to see something that hasn't been seen by anyone There's yet. Jen. Jen's just got up. There's Jen making a tea. <laughs> so um, for anyone who missed, we're at Yost and Jenny's property in Mumbolk. Um, and we're about to reveal a big project that Yossi has been working on for a very it's long time. Grapes. grapes left in my leaves. We had 130 <laughs> bunches of grapes this year off one plant. Isn't that nuts? Wow. So you can see yeah, it's a swimming pool, it's undercover. Um, but this is Yossi's property. We've just changed the colour of the swimming pool and uh, put a seat in it so people don't feel like they're drowning. <laughs> You can see all of the <laughs> plants, flowers that Yost is in is that girls? for his insulation. It's cooked. Chickens down there. Did that one get better? Did yeah. You know what I gave it? Yogurt. Tyrone's, Tyrone's yogurt. Oh. <laughs> Hi, so, Tyrone, if you're watching. <laughs> on the 20th of July this year, we are going to go back to where the greenhouse started in 2008. We're going back to Fed Square and we're going to build a completely zero waste house. And the idea is that, um, yeah, by not wasting anything, we're turning everything into something. So just like nature, we're, we're turning everything that we currently call waste becomes a resource for another thing. And it's a whole new, a whole new way of looking at living, using our space to be productive, to grow, grow food, um, and it's going to create a new cuisine as well, which is probably, you know, the building's really exciting and all of the systems are amazing. But you know, for, for Joe and I particularly, the the idea of creating a future food system is really exciting. You know, ideas that uh, we've discussed for a long time, but we can actually do it now, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So there's um, lots of um... eating what we have is the biggest thing. Yeah, there'll be hundreds of different types of plants used, but there's also like aquaponic systems and freshwater mussels and freshwater prawns. Um, we've got things like a mushroom wall with, you know, 15 different types of mycelium uh, growing, crickets. So it's actually really inspired by the work of Western Price who visited um, ancient cultures or primitive cultures around the world. And um, he became quite obsessed with the Australian Aboriginal culture because... Um, was the only population in the world where he uh, said there was zero tooth decay. So he actually, there was no tooth decay. So the Alaskans in uh, um, had like 0.3, you know, um, other, other populations had some tooth decay, but he actually said that the Australian Aboriginals had perfected a diet so good that that was the best nutrition on earth. That so we're trying to emulate that by, um, and we've luckily, because he was a scientist and a doctor, we've got proper data, so we can actually try and recreate that diet, that incredible diet, and use the wisdom to try and use it uh, with modern technology. So we've got like a toilet system that's from Israel, where the methane that we generate will be used for the cooking, and then we've got yeah, lots of every, everything that we currently in the world call waste is actually a resource in this, and yeah. So anyway, this is it. Like and this is what it looks like. You are the first people to see. So this is uh, Matt and Joe's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> the whole, this is the biggest building um, I could design on one truck. So that frame up there, which is a living space, this frame that we're standing in goes inside that one, and then the three stairwell frames. If you look at it from this angle, it probably see a bit better. So big. Just for uh, Ronnie, who's asked about the wicking beds, we're actually going to um, make one shortly. So just hang in there. We'll yeah. answer those questions very soon. Oh, hold on. What have I done? One sec. There we go. You, you stand next to that. No, no, no. You no, could. No, no. You have no one's seen Joe yet. Here we go. I'm going to go back so you can see the. Yeah, so that's it. So I'm quite obsessed with um, 
the idea that every single element can be recycled. So it's completely steel frame. And this steel frame doesn't need foundations because we're putting 40 tonne of soil on the roof. So the wicking beds that you saw before are going on the two roofs. Now, our goal is to grow enough food to nourish two people by utilizing everything that, that is um, currently wasted. So Matt's just showing how the wicking bed's going to work on the very top roof. So this actually, yeah. Yep. Do you want to say what you no, you can. So this, um, this will be around the edge up on the roof. So these are just barrels that we can use for extra storage of water if we need to. Is it an extra 100,000 litres we could put? Uh, it's uh, 20,000 litres on the roof. Um, yep. So they're multi purpose. They'll hold the wicking beds around the roof. They'll make a bit of a secure edge so we don't fall off after you know, too, too many beers. Um, <laughs> And, and yeah, we can use them for storage as well. So that's what they, they look like on the inside. It's just a simple frame that Yossi has put together here, just with some scrap metal that he had around around the place. And that just kind of creates a nice little edge. Now, where's the pocket? Uh, that's a good question. I'll go and find it. Um, but yeah, you can see here, this, uh, so if you're standing here, you can see this is the stairwell, which I call the spine, the heart and the stomach of the house which goes all the way up. This is going to be where all the food is going to be grown in winter. So we've got um, glass, it's like a glass house. So it's actually treated like an outdoor part of the house, but it gives you access as well. And a toilet will be up there as well. And below the toilet will be a biodigester and that creates all the methane, but the bacteria in the biodigester actually converts all of the organic waste from the kitchen and from the toilet into uh, a really amazing fertilizer. And that swimming pool. And then the swimming pool is going to go over there, which is going to be a natural pool filled with fish, and um, and but that also collects all the water. So the whole thing, all the water will be recycled and filtered and reused. So really, uh, the total footprint is seventy-eight square meters. So it's quite small footprint, but it is it, when you're standing it like this, it's massive. Yeah. So you'll be able to go to Federation Square. Hopefully, if everything goes well, and come and see this. That's the living space up there. And yeah, this is the stairwell that um, with a battery wall. So the whole thing, the top of it will actually have solar panels on it and we'll have uh, a, an incredible battery system that will allow us to be completely off grid as well. Yeah, so. Thank you. And so with the, um, with the food that we're going to be producing, it's kind of really exciting because it'll be, we're so geared up to just being able to get whatever we want, whenever we want, you know, and like I'm guilty of that. Like we do it all the time. We live really close to a, soup, uh, to a supermarket that we go to probably every day, which is, um, it's, probably, it's, not, it's not cost effective and it, it can become quite wasteful, you know, with, Obviously, packaging and things, you know, you can't buy a bunch of herbs these days. It doesn't come in a plastic container or and a rubber band and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, one of the biggest sort of tips to eliminating waste in the house is eliminating it before it gets to the house. Just don't, don't bring it in. Um, and so by this notion of eating what we have, um, you know, there'll be days where, there'll be weeks where we don't eat meat because we don't have anything. Uh, we'll have fish and insects and stuff, but they won't be you know, an everyday meal. So we'll, our diets will change a lot, but it's really exciting, you know, the idea of preserving all of these things as well. You know, we can, when we have an abundance of fish, uh, you know, salting it and air drying it. So we have, you know, a product that will last for the rest of the year, but we have it available when we need it. Um, fermenting vegetables and stuff like that is a really easy one. Um, dehydrating different herbs and things. So we're going to, throughout the first year, we're going to create a, an amazing larder of ingredients that have never come from anywhere else and never left the house so you can kind of think of this kind of micro cuisine that we're going to be creating it's going to be truly unique and nothing else like it in the world and you know we'll be documenting all of the food that we're producing uh we're talking about uh the oats we're going to grow so 18 beds of oats yeah yeah so we can have yep. porridge every second day uh that should be the <laughs> sort of calculation that we've come to um but yeah i think that's um that in itself is a really amazing thing imagine having a home that um, you know, Joe and I live in and we have guests coming and visiting and stuff like that. We have a guest room as well, so there'll be people staying with us. But you're eating and consuming food that has never been outside of that 78 square meters. Like that's truly and, mind-blowing. And it's also, I think, being immersed in the food system is, is you know, you're, you're, you're living in it. Every time you walk 
into this house. So the bedrooms are going to have beds where, where stuff's going to grow. The, the, every time you walk into the kitchen or you walk into the house, the first thing you see is this huge mushroom wall. And so like the steam from the shower actually gets pumped and funneled into the mushroom wall. The, uh, the air from the mush, mushroom, uh, uh, well, it's, this is actually, the entrance is actually called the mushroom. It's a room. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually pumping the air from the shower into the into the mushroom and then from the mushroom into the stairwell and there's things like uh joe because you're so good at turning you know what do we do for milk so wherever mm. there's certain things that you just can't imagine living without but then we've got these incredible alternatives like tiger nuts which um the world's first milk you know one and a half million years ago apparently we were eating 80 percent of our food came from these tiger nuts so we're constantly discovering all these alternatives not only is it delicious, but it's also loaded with fiber, unlike conventional milk. And it means that we can grow more than enough um, tiger nuts here to be able to drink half a liter of milk a day, you know? So stuff like, so we're, we're, yeah, it's going to be like a big experiment. There's going to be lots of stuff that's not going to work, but you know, we're just going to have a, have a go. And, and I think it's going to be really exciting to be able to see what's possible when you live in a closed system. Because there's no doubt about it, like the most destructive thing we humans do on the planet is um, eat, eat. And it's because of the way we eat. So what happens if you actually totally turn that notion upside down and change it to living and eating and growing where you live? Well, I think um, it's going to be really interesting just to change that mindset. And I think a lot of people talk about eating less processed food, less meat. Um, and it's because it's convenient, right? That's why we eat this stuff. Because you can get it, it's readily available it's cheap you know yep. you can buy cheap average burgers and fries for like seven dollars whereas you know to buy a healthy meal actually costs more money but if you're immersed in it that mindset's gone straight away because yep. that's this you you're in a space where you have everything right there and that's the only option so you kind of look at things and go you know i'm really eyeing off that daikon radish in two weeks time and you know your mindset will change and you'll kind of get excited by those things and, and become resourceful you know instead of chopping the top off that daikon radish and throwing it away you might be sauteing it with um you know this with some other little herbs and stuff to make a delicious meal so you'll kind of think differently about the food that you have which is um which is really cool and seasonally you know you really get the idea of you become so immersed in your food system that you start to understand the changes and you know turning turning mushrooms in autumn into into vitamin d tablets by simply drying them in the sun you know upside down so you create this incredibly dry so that can be stored for years and years and years. So using and adopting ancient methods. Of, Proven primitive techniques. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But celebrating them, you know, and, and, um, and using them in a modern way. So, yeah, it's going to be, yeah. Yeah, it's although be, it's, a, it's a new, it's a kind of a new system and a new cuisine, all of the inspiration is coming from history. I think yeah. there's not actually any new ideas here. We're just kind of reversing instead of thinking of ways we can do things better with new technology and stuff we're kind of looking historically at things that worked and not just from from australia from around the world you know there's like you mentioned techniques from israel techniques from from europe um and all that kind of stuff so there's a lot of different ideas coming together here and through a long period of time so hundreds of years of of you know agriculture and stuff and we're really lucky that we can cherry pick a lot of those ideas and implement them into one space very cool should we make a wicking bed yeah let's do it so I'll get the grinder set up. So we're going to make a wicking bed now, which is where the guys were talking about all of the food coming from. There's going to be, you know, different walls and um, aquaponic systems, but these are the barrels. So are they $20, Josie? 20 bucks. Yeah. 20 bucks. That's what they look like. And there's Matt picking some strawberries. Strawberries. Yosti, just getting the tools ready. Goats. So a really inexpensive way to grow food. So here's the top of the barrel. So what you can do is when you cut the barrel off, um, you can use a, uh, well, there's so many different swords you can use, but what I just use is chalk or anything. Sorry, someone just off. asked, where did you get the barrels? So if you Google 44 gallon drum recycler, 
every city has got at least half a dozen companies that have that have recycling businesses. So any city in Australia, because these are so ubiquitous, they're used everywhere, you can find recycled drums almost anywhere. And like you mentioned earlier, always go for the black ones because they're always recycled. Yeah, so these are made from polypropylene, the same material that's used for flower pots and... So it's likely this is mostly flower pots? Um, or all kinds of no, no, these, well, they're often recycled to be reused for, you know, they're not actually cut up. Usually they're washed out and then reused again for other materials. Oh, sorry, the plastic is used to make this. Yeah, yeah. Well. Yep. So if you buy a plant in Australia in a black pot, it's always made from recycled plastics. So Garden City Plastics, who make most of Australia's flower pots, last year they recycled 14 million wow. kilos of um, plastic. And uh, the beauty about um, black is you can just recycle it over and over and over again. So if you buy, you know, in a mm -hmm. coloured pot, then it's always virgin plastic and that's the same with these so you can buy like mustard gets imported in a beautiful mustard colored um 44 gallon drum i love those as well i call them 44 gallon soil drums instead of oil drums. <laughs> and so all i do is yeah you cut the top off you just mark it off with a with some chalk you can get a grinder or you can get a hacksaw or you can even do it by hand it's actually not that hard to do i'll and post a little video of how i did it because it's quite noisy does it have to be a certain amount, like a, at a certain level, or is it just that you cut the top off? Well, wicking beds work best when, they're, when there's at least 30 centimetres of soil. So most plants, you know, you can't really grow carrots or anything if there's less than 30 centimetres of soil. And so you don't, try, don't take too much off. Okay. I'll, I'll show the measurement in, in the video that I post. But what I do is I cut this off, this side off, and the side that's got the hole, has that. Okay, so the part that you cut off has that hole there. Yeah, and then you can just push this in, and that's it. And you line it with a bit of hessian. Yeah, you can put a t old t-shirt or anything. I prefer to use um, uh, non-synthetic materials, so like natural materials like hessian or an old jumper or a t-shirt. And that just, just over the top, it stops soil from going in there, but it actually also means that the water will always wick up. And then you just fill it with soil. Oh yeah, so it goes along here. And is that whole thing under there oh, full? Of... I'll show you. Okay. And then um, and just so a nice little finish. You can obviously just leave it like that, but um, you can either build a timber frame around the top or you can use the steel ones that Yosti's done. Yosti said he just used that because he had it lying around, so it's using it up. But um, just kind of finish it off nicely so you get a nice edge on there. And for the person who asked about the strawberries, how they're growing in the wall, they all sit in, you have a look, little pots. They're just sitting in little pots. It's pretty amazing. It's amazing there's still strawberries on here with flavour. Mmm, yummy. Oh, what have I done? There we go. So you can, um, what we're going to do is just use other barrels, like I mentioned, because we'll get extra water storage. Um, so you could have the two for the base and wedge some, um, some chocks in there to hold them together. Or like in the greenhouse, you can make a frame to sit these on nicely. A frame's good because it gives you the storage underneath as well. So whatever works. Or they could just sit on the ground as well. You're going to sit them down and just put a couple of chocks on either side and then they won't roll around. But keeping them off the ground is a much nicer, much nicer to work with. So you kind of don't have to crouch down so much. Just running around looking for something. So Yost mentioned um, before um, when we got here that the uh, metal was causing a little bit of heat, so wood would be preferred. Oh, but yeah, that's this right. was... had a bit of um, with the lettuces and stuff. Uh, the extra heat in the greenhouse was kind of cooking the edges a little bit. So um, he mentioned, yeah, wood might be a better option. Oh, but again, it's, it's pretty pretty minor detail. Here's a towel that you could use as well, like more. But any fabric, and it doesn't just need to be one piece of fabric, it could just be. And you kind of make a shield to stop all the dirt. Yeah. Yes, 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 come here. And then you just fill it with soil. Now, um, I wanted to know the height. So that's 400 mil from the bottom. 
but I've cut it. Oh, okay, cool. So I just use the spirit level. You cut, cut it 400 mil from the bottom. And that way there's always at least 300 mil of soil. Now by the time the soil comes down there. And then you um, get one of these. And it's important that you use Teflon tape because if this drips, you lose, it's amazing how much water you'll lose. So you really do need to make sure you use Teflon tape. And then that way you won't. So these, these three pieces will cost you more than the drum. How crazy is that, huh? <laughs> and again, I never use PVC. I always use polypropylene. I can't stand PVC because it can't be recycled. So make sure you, when you go to Bunnings or Reese or wherever you go, might of 10. And the beauty about this is, let's say you grow potatoes. You don't want potatoes to get too wet. So you can just have it like that. And what's also good, if, you, if you've got, if you're worried that the soil might, they say that once a year you really should drain it so you can just have it like this and the water will just drain out but it's such a simple i mean there's probably a million different wicking beds you can use buckets you can use anything for a wicking bed but this is just a wicking bed that i think is a really good practical size and i love referring to it as you know we've produced so many carrots per barrel you know if we're using the instead of using barrels of oil or barrels of soil so in total, we'll have um, 120 of these on this house. It's up there. Yeah. Pretty cool. So yeah, I mean, really two barrels is a square meter. You know, so you, so it's 900 by just, yeah, 55. So if you've got two next to each other, that's really square meter. But like if you plant rocket and, you know, some of the loose leaf lettuces in here, you'd struggle to keep up. Even a family would struggle to keep up with one barrel. Yeah. You know, things like cos lettuce and stuff, you can actually rip, keep ripping the leaves off and it just keeps reproducing. Such an efficient way to grow. Yeah, and there's zero waste, zero loss. And I always make the soil from 100% waste. So it's composted organic waste. It is worm, the worm castings are always introduced. I've put about um, a 20 litre bucket of worm castings in each barrel as well, just for nutrients. And you'll get worms in there as well? Yeah. It is, this is actually also a great worm farm. So if you wanted to have a worm farm, you could, you know, make a, and worms don't like drying out either. So I would do the same thing. You don't have to, you could put a, you know, some kind of hessian or something in front of there, but it is probably a good idea in, in summer to do this with a worm farm so that the bottom remains moist because worms hate drying out. Drying out. And that's why this is such an amazing invention because this is a perfect environment for microflora. So it's a perfect environment for growing food that's really good for your gut flora and, and diversity. Oh, wow. Oh, well. So yeah, there it is. There it is. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, let's have a look. Sorry. So simple. I'll put the Okay. Another animal on in your park. We've got a couple of questions. Yeah. Through. Um, Thanks for that. So Pam was asking about the strawberries. Are they miniature? These the plants I have need more space. Is there a frame that you built for the pots? So can you tell us a bit about the strawberry wall? Yeah, it's just um, two sheets of Rio mesh welded together, thirteen centimeters apart. And yeah, they hold a 13 centimetre pot. And then are they, a, an what type story. of, it's, a, it's, it's, an it's uh, called Rugen Alexandria. It's, uh, I get it from a company in Germany called Gelito Staudensamen. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, <laughs> if you have tiny strawberries in France, this is the one. So, you know, when you go to France and you have those beautiful little strawberries in summer, they're a bit bigger than the Alpine ones. They just, they grow a little bit longer. But yeah, this is a variety that my uncle, grows in Bordeaux for restaurants. So it's like a wild strawberry, but they're just a little bit bigger. Rugen Alexandria. And it does really well. I mean, they're going yellow now because it's getting cold and we normally prune the wall back in July and then it just comes back and goes nuts again. Yeah, wow. The last strawberries that we had were in there for 10 years. So. It's incredible. 
Uh, we've also got a question about, um, could you use the metal drums the same way? You can, but the metal drums get hot. I mean, the, that's another good thing actually about using black drums. In the, the, they're like big solar panels. So in winter, the barrels warm up and, and it's, a, it's the same reason that farmers grow strawberries in black plastic and capsicums in black plastic. And if you're wondering, I mean, ob obviously for to suppress weeds as well, but it actually warms the soil. That's one good thing about using black drums as well. Because in winter, you, you can never get enough sun or enough warmth. Um, with steel, they'd probably get too hot, but you could get, we could work around that by possibly putting a timber rim on the top and that'll stop the, the heat from burning the leaves. But yeah, to be honest, I've never used steel ones. I've only used plastic ones. Uh, we've got another question from Pam who's asked, uh, is there a rendering on the finished house? Um, there will be, yeah. So we're on the 20th of July this year, we're starting at Federation Square. So we're gonna build on site and uh, we'll be showing stuff as we go. So the whole house will be finished with, uh, there's no FSC timber. So the whole thing is steel frame and the interior is made from uh, annual crops. So the cladding is made from compressed straw. Um, the floor finishes are a combination of cork and uh, linoleum made from linseed. And then, yeah, do you have access to all the different materials that we use? And yeah, that, that stuff will all become available as we, um, as we start building. Awesome. We've got some questions about um, the plastic. So what about the plastic leaching into the soil or food? Sorry, that was the Max, the cat, jumping on top. <laughs> Mate, I think Jess is trying to get Max. Max, come here. Stay with me. <laughs> um, I personally am not worried about polypropylene because, um, like I said, it's been used for 30, 40 years and um, it's used for flower pots and, and uh, I would be concerned about using other forms of plastic, but polypropylene I'm not. Uh, okay, so that answered a couple of people were um, questioning about that. Um, we've got someone asking if you, Yoast, can you just repeat? about recycling of PVC versus polypropylene and also who makes the recycled black plant pots? Are they made in Australia? Yeah, 98% of flower pots used in Australia. Can you believe it? 98% are made in Australia. And um, so it's almost 100%. And it's mainly because we're an island and we're far away. So we don't really get any plants being imported or anything like that. We have the world's best setup. Um, which, which was set up about 25 years ago by the nursery industry of Australia, where if you go to a place like a nursery or Bunnings, there's cages and those cages allow you to bring back your pots and all those pots get recycled back into flower pots. So when you buy plants, try and buy them in black pots because they're always made from recycled plastic. And um, Garden City Plastics, who make most of Australia's flower pots, are the biggest recyclers of plastic in Australia. So good. And um, yeah, it's... PVC is a nightmare. There is one company in uh, Germany that does recycle PVC, but it's it's a tox. It's uh, yeah, it, it releases gases when it gets recycled. It's a, it's a problem to recycle. We just shouldn't be using it, really. So, like people that have followed my work for many years know that I'm a big believer in just using materials that can be endlessly recycled, can be easily recycled, and are non-toxic to people who use them. That's another thing in this building. There'll be no glues, no formaldehyde. It's completely uh, natural materials. Um, here we go. Is, oh wait, there's another question about these 98% black plastic pots that are being recycled in Australia. Can we be optimistic about more plastic being recycled in Australia? Not sure if you're, it's a space for you to answer, but I guess about recycling, like what is your take on it? Well, um, the federal government did an audit last year. Melissa Price, who was the environment minister, commissioned an audit. So we actually know for the first time exactly how much plastic we produce as a country because we didn't even know that. And um, Scott Morrison announced last year that by July 2021, plastic export, export of waste will be banned. It simply won't be allowed. So that has, um, and I have uh, met with uh, people like Angus Taylor, um, Warren Trust, there's, there's some mem uh, federal members that have come to Mombok and spoken to me about 
what's going on. And I, I would like to think that within the next 12 months, there'll be some serious integration of technology that will allow more recycling to happen. Contamination of plastic is still a big problem. So, you know, I think that we need to just completely avoid it, using it in the first place where we can. But, um, you know, it's been pretty depressing with the whole coronavirus thing to see the amount of waste that is being generated with masks and gloves. And so, you know, that whole, we, there was some real momentum around getting rid of takeaway coffee cups. That, that's mm -hmm. all just out the door now. And uh, I just wish we would actually focus on creating materials that when we do use them, there's no reason why gloves can't be recycled. There's no reason why masks can't be recycled. But if we design those materials to actually be recycled at the end, we can solve a lot of problems. And I think that that's where a lot of the energy needs to go. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's, that's partially why we're putting on this festival. It's kind of like, there are so many ways to reduce waste. It's not just looking at some of the, you know, your reusable cups and that sort of stuff. But, you know, it's great to see responsible cafes encouraging people to ask questions and to also share that um, cafes can do contactless calls and things like that. Um, yeah, so that's really fantastic. We've got another question. Um, is there any VOCs that might affect the food from the plastic? No, no, no VOCs. When, when it comes to polypropylene, so the problem could be that this barrel is being used for a chemical. And so that's why it's important to ask the company that recycles them, is it food grade? So if it's had something like canola oil or if it's had um, vinegar, but they're often used for vinegar, vinegar as well. You may find that I've had them myself with vinegar that you get a bit of an odor, but because I'm putting bio biologically rich soil into them, the microbes eat that stuff up and it really gets locked up in the, in the fats of the bacteria that are in the soil. So I'm not too concerned about that. And then most people that I know that recycle are genuinely awesome people and, and uh, will do the right thing. So just, build a relationship with the company that recycles. There's lots of great companies that recycle barrels. Just say, look, I want to turn these into, into wicking beds or into um, pots. They'll tell, advise you straight away whether it's uh, possible or not. Okay, brilliant. Uh, we've got uh, Lachlan who's wondering if you can share how you make or source the soil for the beds. Well, I'm lucky here in Mombok. I've got basically 50 metres away shore crop, a massive um, compost farm. Uh, we're in Mombok, I'm surrounded by people that make compost. So Shawcroft get all of the organic waste from all of the surrounding farms and nurseries and compost it down over 12 months. They also get all the autumn leaves from like Whitehall City Council and, and make this incredible compost. It's just like when it comes in a bucket, all the worms are just hanging off it. And, you know, so we're lucky there. And then I um, always incorporate worms. So, you know, you could, that could easily be a worm farm, put a lid on it so the birds can't access it or rats or mice can't get into it. And that worm farm could convert easily all of your organic waste for a family of five, that one barrel. And it just reduces it down into these, the worms eat it up. And that's another good thing is actually add a little bit of grit. Worms need um, stones. They actually ingest stones and it's the stones that actually rub the material together and break it down. So add a little bit of grit, which could be shell grit or a, you know, a smash up some moisture shells. That's another great thing to put in the bottom of wicking beds, moisture shells, get some zinc in there. So, you know, the food will contain what you put into it. So try and recycle, try and build a worm farm, get worm juice into it. And um, yeah, that's, that's how I make soil. No, that's really cool. I didn't know the worms needed stones and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So often people will, will find that if they have only uh, soft organic materials going into a worm farm, it's always good to just put a little bit of, um, it could be uh, rock dust, just buy a bag of rock dust and that, that the worms go crazy for it because they ingest it and they actually use that to actually break things down. Yeah, I guess you could also like um, ask a local restaurant to kind of see if they've got shells and stuff they'd just like to donate to you just quietly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's already some great, um, but if you go to a stokehouse and order a oysters all their oyster shells go through the dishwasher yeah and they all get um used to make beds in the ocean out in the, in the bay and they're rebuilding and restoring beds there's some great projects there because it, again it's not a it's not a waste it's actually a resource yeah there are not the market market we're also collecting. Collecting. um muscle shells if you walk around here because all of the waste from silo and brothel came back here 
you'll often actually still find mussel shells and oyster shells from from that. And then the bones we actually turn oh. into charcoal and add that into the soil as well. Yeah. I guess also if you start eating out at restaurants, you know, bring your own little container after you've had your um, mussels or oysters or whatever you're eating out, you can also take them home as well. Doggy bag yep. those. Yeah, and when you go and buy fish or when you go and do stuff, just yeah. bring a container. Like it's not that hard. Yeah. And it's all about planning. You just need to plan. If you can plan, then you can avoid waste. That's right. You know, you've got your wallet, your keys and a container. Um, so uh, Jing is wondering what sort of fruit and veg do you recommend you um, that you start growing first in the weekend beds? I love growing rocket because it's bulletproof and it's so like you can't growing your own rocket. You can't beat it. It's, yeah. it's unlike, unlike buying it's it. It's my favorite. Store. I think radishes are a good start as well because they're quick. So you get something like you plant a garden and you get really excited, but then you get like, you know, the following two weeks, nothing really happens and you get a bit knocked down about it, but you know, you don't get any instant result. Whereas a radish, sometimes in the right conditions, if it was warm, you'd have them in three weeks. Yep. I'd be, you know, nearly golf ball size. So radishes, I reckon, are one of the most rewarding things and most delicious as well. Like when you pull a radish straight from the ground, don't even wash it, just brush off the dirt. Um, and then eat it, you'd never have a better taste than radish. Yeah. I mean, and you can use the leaves in a salad or you can saute them down in a pasta or something as well. So it's a, it's a good one that's really fast, really cheap seeds as well. Yep. Um, and you silver get a, beet is another. Yeah, sil silver beet's brilliant because it grows really fast. Uh, it's delicious and it's got a multitude of uses, everything from raw in salads to saute to making a filling for a filled pasta, uh, braising it down for a long time, fermenting it. You, know, yeah. you can do endless, endless things with silver beet. I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, trying to eat something raw every day. So it could be a raw carrot, it could be, you know, raw um, a salad, obviously salad leaves, um, radish, uh, yakon, you know, things that are, because that's the best for your gut flora as well. So well, things that have been in dirt. Yeah, things that have been in dirt. You can, if you're worried about it, you can wash it in water. The, like the, the, the coating, the bacterial coating or the microflora coating that's on it, you know, will pretty much stay on it. You don't. Uh, and that's why um, we don't peel a lot of vegetables we use as well, because that's where majority of your nutrients and often a lot of flavor as well. So yeah. like, um, just, give, just give everything a little wash. Sometimes um, you can just use a little scour to give it a little scrub if you need to. Try to avoid that because you can kind of get rid of too much of it. But um, yeah, don't, don't peel your root vegetables in particular. Yeah, and that's also where the fiber is. So, you know, high um, people with the populations with the highest gut flora count tend to usually have a very high fiber count. So if you look at the Hudsa, they, their fiber intake is something like 25 times more than the average Westerner. So a, a, a baby that's uh, being weaned at three months will have more fiber in a morning feed of uh, you know, the seeds that they might have than all of the fiber that we'll have for the whole day. So you can't have a high, you can't have healthy gut flora without a high fiber content. Yeah. Right. We've also got some more questions about the wicking beds. How often do you need to top up the wicking beds with water? This is the craziest thing and this is why I love it so much and this is why I think Colin Austin should receive an order of Australia. So in winter, once a month, can you believe that? You only need to water once a month and in summer, at most, once every two weeks. And so, and the beauty is the water doesn't drain out so you don't lose the water and more importantly, you don't, you don't lose nutrients. So you... You, you keep the nutrients and that's the biggest problem that it's estimated that the 500 million tons of fertilizer that we used last year all made from gas only 17 percent of that was actually absorbed and used by the plant the rest was uh, lost mm. washed away and you know ocean dead zones killing of rivers streams then the problems with the great barrier reef is actually the absorption of the runoff of the fertilizer that's not being used Mm. So that's one. That's another reason why I think that the wicking bed is one of Australia's best inventions ever. Yeah, it's incredible considering, you know, water is life and how much water we we spend, like droughts and all that sort of stuff. Like the best use of water is that, you know, being able to keep it at the source where it is. So, yeah, being able to just water a month in winter is incredible. Um, We've also That's got questions. Cool, but if you're busy and you lead a busy lifestyle or you, yeah. you tend to work interstate, you might not be home for a week. It's really the only way to have a veggie patch because, you know, most people every night in summer, they're watering their veggie patch. And, and there's a lot yeah. less stress on the plants, so you don't need to use pesticides or insecticides or, um, yeah, the plant's not stressed. 
because it's always got access to water and um, yeah, healthy plants, healthy people. Mm. Uh, we've got a question about how much food will the whole space actually produce? We'll be able to tell you in July 2021. <laughs> I mean, look, I've, I've got a goal, but uh, we, we, each human each, eats about a ton of food a year. If we could grow 2,000 kilos of food, it's not really about that. It's just about the nutrient density that I'm more concerned about. Um, yeah, it's, it's really tasty food, interesting food. I want this to be the most exciting food in the world. You know, I want people to go, wow, why, why are we uh, destroying the planet with our current food system? This food looks so exciting. It's healthy, it's nutritious, it's beautiful, it tastes yeah. good. I think that goes back to when we first met over 10 years ago when, you know, my search for making the best food always went back to the most ethically produced food because when food's grown properly, it has flavor and that's why we can serve such simple food because you know like we use a radish for the example like we could serve radishes from that hot house for lunch today just with some beautiful cultured butter or feta or something and it'll be the most delicious thing you ever eat but you can't replicate that with a supermarket brought radish because yeah. it doesn't have that live that life and that flavor so you know but from a culinary point of view joe and i's sort of quest to, to serving the best food has always led us back to food that's grown better and, and it, it, it's just obvious like when you you eat the food and it has so much flavor and 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 texture as well you know like yeah. you, when you grow rocket in one of these things it's almost meaty it's like really you really got chew on it and, and it's got a lot of fiber and and it'll keep a lot longer as well like if you've got too much you know i'd always suggest cutting it when you're going to serve it and use it but if you've got too much and you're going to chuck it in the fridge it'll last for like nearly two weeks because it's it's got so much structure to it so much body as opposed to hydroponically grown rocket that in two days it'll be watered in the fridge yeah. yeah, you don't need to add anything because yeah. it already tastes delicious. Yeah, some a bit of oil and a bit of salt, and you're, you're like, it's going to be the most delicious salad. And we, we get it all the time with food. We serve people. They go, how do you make it taste so good? It's like, well, I don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like one of the biggest things for me in a restaurant is a side salad has to be the most delicious thing you eat. And if, if you can't make the side salad delicious, what are you doing trying to do anything else? Like it's the most simplest thing, but there's nowhere to hide. Yeah. You can't hide behind fancy dressings and fancy this and that like it's just honest and and delicious and like that's how i gauge restaurants i'll always order a side salad and if it's if it's if there's no care given to it like it kind of makes you wonder what's going on in that environment so you know those, those simple things are where you know this stuff really shines I think. yeah yeah no it's it's going to be um it's yeah i'm i haven't been this excited in years it's the first project that we've uh well, Matt and Joe know I've been trying to get this project up for five years. And so I'm so grateful for Federation Square really believing in this and supporting it, especially at this time. Uh, I'm, uh, it's going to be an ex exciting year ahead. I'm hoping uh, in 2021 that we'll be able to actually, you'll be able to come and visit and we'll do tours. We'll do virtual tours, obviously, but depending on what happens with the uh, coronavirus, hopefully we'll be able to have open doors and people can come and actually see all the different systems. And have some guests around for dinner. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. My battery's getting low, guys. <laughs> okay, we've got some other questions, but we're also sending out some information. So Yos is also, you're going to do some videos and things to follow up. Um, so we might wrap it up before Joe's video um, <laughs> the battery dies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yos. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, Joe, for sharing no this. Worries. It's been um, incredible to see a solution about growing at home, but not only that, kind of like so many aspects of learning about food and um, soil health and nutrients. I'm sure people will be walking away with lots more to research. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for kicking off the festival. We've got some pretty incredible things happening um, the rest of this weekend. Um, so I'll just quickly um, go through. We have, um, after years, we've got the Waste List. Um, we've got Waste List. Here we go. I will share this with you so you guys can see. We have um, just an amazing kickoff with Imagining a World Without Waste. Uh, we will be heading off on to our next one, which is our Waste List community. So Kirsty from Zero Waste Victoria, we're hosting that. We've got Ellie from Share Waste, so you might know about the app. Uh, David from Gold Coast Repair Cafe. 
Letitia from Brunswick Tool Library, Joe from Good for the Hood. So it'll be a really great conversation with lots of different people in different areas talking about how our community can be wasting less. Um, we've also got this afternoon our feature on plastic. So we're going to be jumping in the story of plastic. That's a film for people from the story of stuff. We've got a screening at 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, after the 1 p.m. screening, we've also got an incredible panel that'll be helping you address um, actions and um, empowering you to take um, easy steps. We've got um, Heidi who's been running a workshop about an app that you can be a citizen scientist contribute and it's already had some really great successes. Uh, we've got Anthony Hill who's a great educator from Plastic Pollution Solution. Um, Farm, who's a micro um, marine biologist with Eco Center, who's been um, looking at the microplastics within um, two of the rivers around um, the Yarram River, so two of the rivers in Northern Melbourne. Um, so done a great project for the last three years, as well as Rebecca, who is the founder of Plastic Free July. So it's 10 years of Plastic Free July. Um, that's an incredible challenge for you to jump into. And on Sunday, slow fashion, we've got a great panel who'll be a great team going through a workshop, um, reviving and rethinking your wardrobe as well as mending, um, looking at the arts, so how the arts can inspire, move and empower people for change. And we'll finish off with our incredible young change makers on Sunday. So we're really looking forward to sharing the rest of the festival with you. Thank you, Joost and Matt and Joe. Is there anything Thank else you. Want to say before we head off? Oh, no, just thanks for having us all. Yeah, everyone grow something. Yeah. <laughs> grow some food. Yeah. Grow some food, you won't regret it. And Google <laughs> G-Biota Bed, Colin Austin. He's a legend. Awesome. Unreal. We'll share it out as well. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see thanks, you around for the rest of the festival. All right. Thanks, Costa, as well. Bye. Bye. Matt, thanks, guys. Thanks, Joe. No worries. Unreal. See ya. See ya. <laughs> This Hi. Hey. Hey. Hello. It's like Noah's Ark up here. <laughs> oh my gosh. So cute. <laughs> How are you guys going? Yeah, good, thank you. Um I was supposed to go into um, a practice round and I've accidentally hit go. So we've got some participants who are watching us set up. Oh, that's all right. So yeah, you can have a chat. Hi oh, everyone. Welcome to Helen. We've got Oberon. Hello Oberon. I saw that you guys <laughs> in the family was setting up. Kathy, Irina and Hudson. So welcome to some of our participants yeah. who jumped in early. Super prepared. <laughs> awesome. So small but so much Here's skin. Snowy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Hello, Snowy. Oh. This is, this is Molly. Molly. Hey, Molly. So we're here at Mumbolk. At Yost's property. Beautiful. This is Yost and Matt. Get a house tour, a house tour. <laughs> <laughs> the goats. Oh, look at the goats. <laughs> so hopefully my connection will stay on. Yeah. Yep. I'm just going to flick this around. Awesome. So, there's a few more people joining in, which is wonderful. We're All right. just waiting for the rest of the people to come in because you guys are a little bit early, which is fantastic. <laughs> Look at the colour of the soil. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. Oh. Like a bit of a screensaver until we kick off. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, oh, that looks beautiful there. So this is a little cubby house that's been covered in um, a bit of plastic to make a greenhouse. Yep. Wow. There's one of the vegetable patches. Is it a baby goat? 
Yeah, to the two of them. One here. Hey, stop eating that. Hey, put it up. You keep the goats off the plants that you <laughs> that you're growing. Just like that. <laughs> Just gotta grow enough of them. And this is this is Jesse. Jesse, what's in there? Hey, Jesse. <laughs> The veggie patch. Wow. More veggies up there. Beautiful. You can always smell that beautiful fresh air up yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty chilly. This must be something in the drain. Jesse. Here's Molly. We've got Costa in here as well. Hello, Costa. <laughs> awesome. We'll bring uh, we'll bring Costa in. Awesome. Hey, Costa, I'm bringing you in. Costa's here. Costa's here. Hey, how are you, mate? <laughs> Should be. I've just um popped him on. He doesn't have his video or um on just yet. I'll ask him to start his video if he's feeling ready or if he just feels like... Hey, we got hey! you, Costa! Hello! <laughs> <laughs> Woo, you made it! <laughs> Mate, where, you should be a Mombo. Where are you? I know, I, I, I just couldn't I just couldn't drive there quick enough last night, so I'll, I'll put my... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that way, uh, that way he's kind of, he's going to stand in for me. <laughs> That's so good. That's called cheating. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking forward to uh, to this uh, this little gathering. It's going to be fantastic. How are you, mate? You good? Yeah, good. Good. I had a had a uh, fantastic chat to to Emily and Kirsty last night um, ahead of ahead of all the the events they've they've got sorted. And uh, what a great way to kick it off. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. It's you might have to do this going forward like this now. Going, you know, online. Why not? It's cool. Well, you know, you think you're in Mombog, people up in, you know, far north Queensland, Adelaide, Perth. You know, and everyone can just get together. And I mean, look at the quality. I, I'm cold looking at you. And my goats are eating the magnolias. Have a look at this. This new magnolia. It's called um, no, Sweet and Neat. Just plant it. <laughs> These are the dogs trying to get to the mice down there. They were playing hide and seek and my kids, Remy, went in here. Can you believe it? <laughs> That's the strange. <laughs> hey, um, I'll show you. Sweet and neat. Oh, wow. It doesn't look that good now, but it's, um, it, this is going to be the best magnolia since Little Gem, I reckon. Yeah, it's a much tighter leaf, isn't it? Tighter leaf and it actually goes lime green. Like it doesn't, it's not as dark. These are these plants are stressed, but when they get going, I'll cut them back yeah. and then yeah, yeah. That, I mean, awesome for arrangements and and um, displays and things because it just seems so vibrant and tight. Yeah, and I don't know if you know, but um, Canberra University they did a study on uh, the best trees to plant around your house in the case of bushfire, and magnolia came in number one. Wow. Evergreen magnolias are really dense, uh, dense. Uh, they're moist and they just don't burn. So if you want to build like a hedge around your property or, yeah, these are the best trees to plant for, to stop bushfires. Wow, that's 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 interesting to know. Yeah. Flame, flame proof. Mm. Hey, since it's a show and tell, I'll show you one thing. This is, uh, this is my breakfast this morning. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to turn the camera around. Um, how do you turn the, camera, turn the camera around? So uh, click on your picture. Oh yeah. And then up the top you'll see a little camera with a circle thing. Uh, like an arrow going in a circle. Should be next to the, the one second from the left. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah, got it. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, <laughs> right, you need to start a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, well, that, look, I don't, 
I don't want to intimidate at the beginning of a talk, mate, but look, this is, <laughs> I'm snapping at your heels here. People, people will travel thousands of miles to get that. So this is, this is Amaranth from straight off my street. It was all volunteer, just volunteers out on my street. So I've, I've, I've steamed those horta, a couple of my eggs, and uh, I thought I had to put a smile. So. <laughs> Looks so good. Piece of capsicum. A little, little bit of capsicum. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> That's so mate, how are we supposed to compete with that? Yeah, well, look, mate, I, I don't, like I say, I don't want to intimidate. I'm going to go silent now and let you speak with them and all that. Great to have this chat. What a bonus. I, yeah, I was good to away trying to get my ticket and I'm like, shit, yeah, it's going to start. And then and then I plugged in the details and the next second you were there, I was like, oh, I better say hello to the goats. <laughs> That's unreal. I think. Um, Hi, Costa. Like a, Thank you. Right, I'll, I'll I love your breakfast. It, it, it kind of looks like your breakfast is talking. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Matt going? That can be the new stand-in. Costa <laughs> number three. Yeah. 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 Because look, I can, I can, I can sort of stand, stand it up and, 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 and spin it around. <laughs> That's so good. All right, should we kick off? Mm. I'll go silent. Thank you, Costa. Thanks, Ed. Right.